Well, a big Shabbat Shalom to everybody. As you know, the Torah portion is Bahar. And what does Bahar mean? Har. Har is mount. The bait is in or on. So it's in the mount or on the mount, as we know. I think it's quite fascinating that they say the Torah portion is always fulfilled in some way. And here this last week, the Iranian president crashed into the mount. <laughs> uh, the Torah portion, Bahar, what is it all about? The, this Torah portion is all about the Sabbath, the Shemitah cycle, and the Jubilee cycle. In Leviticus 25, 1 and 2, the Lord says to Moses in Mount Sinai to tell the children of Israel, when you come into the land, what? Which I give you. How much does land cost? If you were to go buy an acre in New York City or Los Angeles, land is very expensive. And here the Lord says, I'm giving it to you. Now, if you remember the land... God said is going to vomit out all the Canaanites because of all their abominations. And then he tells Israel, I'm going to give this land to you. And if you don't behave, the land will vomit you out as well. That's why there's something special about the land of Israel. He didn't say that about the land of America. He didn't say that about the land of China. The land of Israel, in some sense, is living. It's alive. This is why most of the commandments only applied in Israel, such as the Shemitah cycle. You don't keep a Shemitah cycle in the United States or in South America, but we need to acknowledge the Shemitah cycle. And if you live in Israel, that land needs to rest. And what does that mean? We're going to be uh, looking at that. But the most important thing is that because God gives it to them, who owns it? God owns the entire earth. And it says in the Bible that he set the boundaries for everybody. And we need to stay within the lines. Okay, we've got to stay within our boundaries. Just like mankind was to rest on the seventh day, the land gets to rest every seventh year. But what's interesting, we might think, hey, if it's my land, why can't I do what I want? Just like your teenage child. You own the house, you own the room, but it becomes his or hers room. That doesn't mean they can start punching holes in the walls. Does that make sense? And so it's the same thing. God has given everyone land. As a matter of fact, he gave every one of the nations their land first, Israel got their portion of land last. Think about it. The first will be last and the last will be first. So I think it's interesting that they were the last nation to get a territory. They didn't even have a territory before. Think about it. Israel with, you know, Abraham, it was a land that wasn't his own. Isaac, it was a land that wasn't his own. Jacob, his whole life wasn't a land of his own. He dies in Egypt, as a matter of fact. And so God determined that this promised land that he promised to Abraham, though, was the last nation of all the nations on earth to get it. And guess what? It was teeny tiny. You would think God would give Israel Russia. I mean, some giant piece of property because he's the boss and I'm the king and I'm taking all this land mass. He took the tiniest portion of everything. Now, the purpose of letting the land rest every seventh year was to realize it's not ours. It's the bosses. We're leasing it. They, were, they couldn't even sell the land, really. They could only lease it because in the, 20, the 50th year of Jubilee, they all got their land back. All right? So we have to realize, uh, they say, why didn't the Bible begin with Exodus? You know, why did it begin with Genesis? Well, the reason why is 
So the entire world will know that God is the one who owns the earth. God is the one who determines the boundaries for every nation. So these concepts teach that the primary force in the universe is God and not the laws of nature. Even the land is a gift. And here's what's interesting. Gave is past tense. Give is present tense. And will give is future, right? Well, here's the thing. It says, I will give you. You see that in that verse? To the land, not which I gave you, not what I will give you, but what I give you. It's present tense. In other words, today it still belongs to Israel. Do you catch that? It's a constant giving. It's not, we don't look back and say, the Lord gave you this promised land. It's no, the Lord gives and continually gives the promised land. So it doesn't belong to the Palestinians. Now look at Psalm 24, 1. It says, the earth is Who's in the fullness, the whole world and all who dwell therein. That means even if you don't believe in God, he still owns you. If you want to ignore his existence, that's fine, but he does exist. I mean, I, I heard this story of uh, these two guys that are in a car and they're driving down the road and the passenger looks at the driver and he says, don't you see that stop sign? And he just speeds past it through the stop sign and he says, I'm the boss out here. Everything's going to be fine. Do you see any police officers? Why? No. And then they're in this big vehicle. It's like a 14-foot high truck. And he's speeding underneath the, this bridge really fast. And the guy says, don't you see that bridge? And he says, I know, but do you see any police? <laughs> it doesn't matter. You're going to crash, you know. So we have to realize there are laws of, uh, of nature, but God is the ultimate force in the universe. Now, here I've got the world spinning, and it says the earth, the whole earth belongs to who? Now, I'm going to give you some math because I love math. There are 197 million square miles of water on the planet. Can you imagine 197 million square miles of water? There are 57 million square miles of dirt. All right? Now, so let's look what happens. We know if 57 million square miles of earth or dirt, 10% is 5.7 million square miles, right? So think of just 10% is 5.7 million square miles. 1%, 1% would be 570,000 square miles. Is everyone following my math? Just cutting off a zero. 1 one hundredth of 1% 1 is 57,000 square miles. Okay, now you think of how small 1% is, and now take 100 and divide it, or now take 1 and divide it by 100. Do you see how it's like next, you can't even see it. All right? So one one hundredth of one percent is 5,700 square miles. The New Jerusalem. You want to know how big the New Jerusalem is going to be, the city? 8,500 square miles Israel is right now. Right now, Israel is only 8,500 square miles. You know what that means? Israel is a little over one one hundredth of one percent. Of all the land mass in the whole world, one percent would be nothing. But you take one and divide it by a hundred, they only get one one hundredth of one percent. But New Jerusalem is going to be 2,250,000 square miles. Now that is a little bit more. As a matter of fact, I mean, here's like New Jerusalem over the United States. I mean, it would be, this city is going to be almost as big as the entire United States for this city. Let's put it up there in the Middle East. It's going to go, I mean, it's all of the Middle East practically. It is huge. Now, 
guess what? This thing is huge. At 5,000 miles away, it would still appear to be more than 130 times larger than the moon. It's that big. This goes well beyond Earth's atmosphere and into outer space. If a building in the city is this high and has 10 feet per story, the New Jerusalem will be 800,000 stories high. 800,000 stories high. Now, take a look at this. I would want the elevator if I was on the top floor. Okay, that's all I know. I mean, look at this. I don't know how well you can see this, but uh, here's the Kármán line where outer space begins. Here's the thermosphere. Up there is the exosphere at 6,200 miles. How in the world are people going to breathe on that top floor unless everything is different? I think that is just totally amazing. Going up, 1,500 miles high is how high the New Jerusalem is going to be. Miles, 1,500 miles miles high. I definitely would want a view. <laughs> okay, now I want you to take a look at this. Here's the land mass, 100%, 57 million square miles. There's 10%, 5.7 uh, million. And then that little yellow, see how small the yellow is? It's 1% or 570,000. But Israel is one-tenth of 1% 1 or 5,700 uh, square miles. And so look, I mean, it's take that little yellow, divide it by 100, and that tells you one-hundredth of 1% 1 is only 5,700 square miles. And Israel is 8,500. So we see that Israel isn't real big. And I'm surprised that the God of heaven and earth, just like he says, he gives us 100% of money, and he just asks for 10% back. He gives us 99% of the earth, 99.99. And he just wants one one hundredth of 1% of space that's his. And guess what? He determines who lives there. Now, look at Revelation 21, 16 and 17. The city lies four square. The length is as large as the breadth. He measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. That's 1,500 miles. 12,000 furlongs is 1,500 miles. And it's a cube. Now, the next thing. Look at Leviticus 25, 3 and 4. It says, six years, year to sow your field. And six years, you shall prune your vineyard, gather in its fruits, but in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, and it is a Sabbath to the Lord. And now he says, you shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. So God is saying, look, this is really mine. I'm giving it to you for six days, but then the seventh day, because it's mine, just like the, in the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the whole purpose was that man would know this doesn't belong to you. The first Sin is stealing. Okay, pride, actually, pride. We, we're, you know, you ain't going to tell us. You ain't the boss of me, God. So let's look at Leviticus. Oh, this also tells us what this is a reminder of. The seventh year is a reminder of the 7,000th year. We know a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Seven days is 7,000 years. So the Messiah will have the millennial reign of rest the 7,000th year, which it is already the sixth day, and it is about 8 o'clock at night, and we know the seventh day begins at sunset on the sixth day. We are at sunset on the sixth day right now. And that's heavy to think about. Okay, so let's look at Leviticus 25, 6, and 7. The Sabbath of the land will give food for you and your manservant, woman servant, those who are hired and those of another country who are living among you for your cattle, the beasts, all the natural increase of the land is to be for food. Basically, when it says even for the beasts, you can't tell a stray beast coming onto your property to go. 
I have my own beast. You can't have it. No. As a matter of fact, they say that the land was to be unguarded. So anyone or any animal could eat of it. So here you have someone that's very possessive. That's my land. You can't have it. He had to allow every single person, animal. As a matter of fact, according to the Holocaust the day, they could not even take care of their own animals until they were sure all the other animals were taken care of first. Now that is amazing. In Exodus 23, 10 and 11, it also talks about it, where he says, six years, put your seed into the fields and get the increase. But in the seventh year, you have to let the land rest and don't plant anything in it so that the poor may have food from it and let the wildlife take the rest. Oh my gosh, you can't. and that's wildlife. That means it's not just yours. Do the same with your vine gardens and your olive trees. It was stated that as long as there was food in the field for the ownerless beast, let's say a beast didn't have an owner. He's just a wild beast coming in. He says, only then may you have food stored for your own animals. If no food was in the field, you had to release any food you had stored up. God wanted to bring home to people that the land and freedom were divine gifts. That's important. So when you think about it, if you have all this food stored up for a horrible time, it's share it. Don't hoard it. God can bless it. It was to, if that would be understood, people would realize there is a supreme owner. And guess what? By every year, counting the years until the Shemitah year, people are also constantly reminded of the fact. The days of the week, when they would count the days of the week, they would go, okay, Sunday is the uh, the seventh day until the Shabbat, the sixth day, the fifth day. They weren't focused on the day. They were focused on how many days until the Shabbat. We need to be focused on how many days until the millennial reign. You follow me? This is what, by doing it like that, by counting it, then we're aware of what's really important. Now, here's the thing. If you've ever received a gift, you're responsible for its maintenance. How many of us have received the gift of life? We're responsible to maintain ours. We have to maintain this gift that God has given us, which includes keeping his commandments, his ordinances, his statutes. Uh, among these are many commandments that directly apply to how Israel is to relate to the dirt because it's a living relationship. If we belong to God, then we must also be good stewards of our bodies. But here's the thing, for God, the land of Israel, he takes it very personal. We have to understand that in the light of what Hamas is doing, what Amalek is doing. God takes the ownership of the land very personal. When it says the land will be a Sabbath uh, rest to Hashem, the Shemitah or the sabbatical year is not just a rest for the land, it's a Shabbat for Hashem. So Hamas destroys the land, but do you know what? When you go and look at Joshua and it says how the land is to be divided up among the 12 tribes, Judah gets the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is personally owned by Yeshua. Do you see why the devil doesn't want him to have it and all the destruction is coming from Gaza and in Judea? Okay, that's important to catch that. Now, in Leviticus 25, verse 8 and 9, he says you're to count seven Sabbaths of years. And seven times seven is what? 49. And then it says, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years will be to you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud shofar on the 10th day of the seventh month. Isn't that interesting? Seventh month, seventh year. On the Day of Atonement, you will sound the shofar throughout all of your land. This is what is so heavy. The Yom Kippur War in 1973 was the first day of the year of Jubilee. That's crazy. And then 50 years later, 2023, on the last day of that Jubilee year, the beginning of the next Jubilee year also starts with a war, October 7th. This is God's calendar. You can't get away from that. And then I have here the Liberty Bell. 
got this big crack in it, but you'll notice at the top is a Bible verse. The Bible verse is this Torah portion right now. Look at verse 10 through 13. You shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. That's what's on the Liberty Bell. It's to be a jubilee unto you. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you knew this, but 1776, when the United States became a nation, was a Shemitah year going into a jubilee year. Wrap your head around that. Wrap your head around that. Okay. And then it says, the jubilee shall be that 50th year to you. Don't sow, don't reap that which grows of itself. Don't gather the grapes of the undressed vines. It is a jubilee. It'll be holy unto you, and you'll eat the increase thereof out of the field. In this year of jubilee, you shall return every man to his possession. Now, the word yovel is the word for jubilee. And what's interesting, yovel refers to movement. You're moving. And since slaves are freed, it represents that all people have freedom to move about as they please. Isn't that fascinating? And during this last jubilee, we were in the midst of COVID. They wouldn't allow us to move. Interesting thought. Now look at Leviticus 25, 23. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land belongs to who? God. He says, you are strangers and sojourners with me. Even though God owned the land, he considered himself a sojourner in the land. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the book of Hebrews says they were all sojourners. Okay, because this land on earth is representative of the heavenly Israel, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's going to be the permanent dwelling place. So God has the right to determine who can take possession of his land and how long it may be leased. But here, God is pleading with his people to remain worthy of the land for his sake, as otherwise, if they become unworthy and have to leave, his Shekinah also will have to go into exile as well. Just like Adam and Eve had to leave the garden, God left the garden, and now Adam and Eve, are, uh, but now Israel, if they have to leave the land, God kicks them out, God's going to leave as well. Look at Jeremiah. Oh, wait a minute. Let me look at this. See where I'm at. Let me show you something here. The year of Jubilee is so important. I want to point out some things here. You see, these, these are like uh, Egypt, these little mountain-like pyramids. And I want you to see that it's up here in the year 2238 from creation of Adam. Uh, that was when Israel entered Egypt. And they're there for 215 years Here's where Moses is born. Moses was born in the year 2373, which was a Shemitah year. Isn't that amazing? Now, here, uh, as they're entering Egypt, just before they enter, Isaac dies. You can see that. That gives you an idea of when Isaac dies. And now, here, Israel enters Egypt. But look at this also. Jacob dies in the year of Jubilee. Jacob not only was born in the year of Jubilee, Jacob dies in the year of Jubilee. And then right here in the year 2373, a Shemitah year, Moses is born. Okay? But look at this. Here's where they're coming out. They came out in the 50th Jubilee. Wow, imagine that. 50 years is the Jubilee year, and it was in the 50th Jubilee that they left. Okay, here is the 51st Jubilee, and the 51st Jubilee is the 358th Shemitah cycle. Now, how long did they wander in the wilderness? Okay, so here they don't enter the promised land until 2493. So Moses gets them out and then they wander and in 2493 they enter 
the promised land, okay? And then each square is seven years. You following me? Okay, so that 2493 and seven is 2500 a.m., which begins the 51st Jubilee. It ends the 50th Jubilee because the Jubilee is 50 years. And so right here, they enter the promised land at the very end of the 50th Jubilee. Now they are in the promised land and it's the 51st Jubilee and the 358th Shemitah cycle from Adam. You following me? Because that's every seven years. And if you count, they're now in the promised land and it is the 358th Shemitah cycle. See right there, they exit Egypt, then they wander, and right there, they enter the promised land. 358th is the numerical value of Mashiach. And that's when they enter the promised land. I mean, come on. Now, let's look at this. Here now we're at the 68th Jubilee. We have the last kings. And right here in 3361, the temple gets destroyed. That's the year the temple was destroyed. Now, let's take a look at something. The 76th Jubilee, the 533rd Shemitah cycle, Yeshua is born in the year 3757, which is the 77th Jubilee. Now, look at this, 3787, the Shemitah year, here was September 14th of 26 AD. That is the very day Messiah started his ministry, okay? He was born, and now he's starting the ministry, and it was literally on September 14th of 26 AD, the year 3787, which was a Shemitah year. It was the 77th Jubilee cycle. Amazing. As I said, the 541st Shemitah cycle, which here, here is Israel. The Yud is 10, the Shin is 300, the race is 200, Aleph is 1, Lamed is 30, which is 541. 541st Shemitah cycle. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. That's what is so amazing when we understand the Shemitah years, the Shemitah cycle, the Jubilee years. All the math just falls into place with everything that Messiah is doing. Okay, now, I kind of just jumped ahead. I want to go over something else with you here. Um, let me see. Now, listen to this. Here is Jeremiah 16, 14 through 16. It says, therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that it will no more be said, the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. That means there's going to be an exodus that is so big, it's going to eclipse the exodus of Egypt. We knew that. That's still a story 3,000 years later. But here there's an exodus coming that's going to be so much greater than the original exodus. It says, the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, from all the lands where he had driven them. I will bring them again to their land. I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, says the Lord, and they will fish them. And after that, I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. Okay, so no longer will they say the Lord that brought them out of Egypt, but here's the Lord who brought them out from every nation. Now, here's what's important. Proclaiming liberty was not just in the Jubilee year. It was every seventh year they would proclaim liberty. As a matter of fact, look at Jeremiah 34, 12 through 16. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I myself made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, saying at the end of every seven years, each of you must set free the Hebrew who has been sold to you and has served you the six years. You must set him free from your service. 
but your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. You recently repented and did what was right in my eyes by doing what? Proclaiming liberty. This is done every seven years. And you made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. But then you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took back his male and female slaves. When you had set them free according to their desire, you brought them into subjection to be your slaves. That's why the Babylonian captivity took place. Now, from the time that they did not want God as their king and they chose Saul, all the way to Jeremiah has been around 490 years. How many years were they in Babylon? How many years were they in Babylon? 70 years. And what, 70 times seven? 490. Okay, so for 490 years, they did not keep the Shemitah cycle. That meant David never kept the Shemitah cycle. As a matter of fact, when you look at the calendar, you will see from the day Saul was anointed king all the way to destruction, they never kept the Shemitah cycle. It started with their first king, Saul. That's when it started. Okay. And do you know when they rejected God as king? What day? It was on Shavuot. It was on Pentecost. The day God became their king, it's like purposely getting divorced on your same day as your wedding. That's what happened. They divorced God the same day he became their king. Now, in 1 Samuel 12, 16 through 19, we see that. It says, now therefore stand and see the great thing the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? When is Shavuot? The wheat harvest. And he says, I'll call to the Lord and he's going to send thunder and rain. The last thing you want when you're harvesting is rain. That you may perceive that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking a king for yourself. So Samuel called the Lord. The Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel, and all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we don't die, for we've added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. Wow. Now, I don't know if you know this, but right now, what month are we in on the biblical calendar? The month of what? E.R. E.R. is the month of war. This is when the 1948 War for Independence took place. This is when the Six-Day War took place. This is when Amalek attacks. Amalek attacks this next week. So you have to be on guard to prepare for an Amalek attack. Now, um, Leviticus 25, 17 through 19. It says during this Jubilee chapter, don't wrong each other. But fear your Lord, for I am the Lord. Therefore, do my statutes, keep my ordinances, and do them, and you'll dwell in the land in what? Safety. The land will yield its fruit. You shall eat your fill and dwell in safety. Right now, Israel is not dwelling in safety because they're not doing the commandments of the Lord. Leviticus 25, 20 and 21. And if you say, what are we going to eat the seventh year? Behold, we are not going to sow or gather or increase. But God says, I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it'll bring forth fruit for three years. Do you realize if this is a miracle, and they'll know if it's true. If every sixth year they get a threefold three years crop worth, they'll, I mean, who could do that? Only God could do that. And this proves to us that God is the author of the Torah and not a man. A man could not guarantee that. No man can guarantee a 300-fold increase, always, in the sixth year. And they didn't even have to have, they, they got the miracle before it even happened, so they should have trusted God. Can you imagine, for almost 500 years, God blessed them with a three-fold increase, and they didn't thank God. Instead, they kept working. Leviticus 25, 25 through 28, it says, if your brother becomes poor, and he's given up some of his land for money. His nearest relation may come and get it back, that which his brother has given up. And if he has no one to get it back for him, and later he himself gets wealth, well, then he also has money to get it back. Let him take into account the years from the time when he gave it up and make up for the loss of the rest of the years to him who took it. And so get back his property. But if he's not able, 
It will be kept by him who gave a price for it until when? Did you believe? And in that year, it goes back to its first owner and it will have its property again. Now, in Leviticus 25, 35, here it talks about one of your brothers becoming poor and falls into poverty. You're to help him like a stranger or sojourner that he may live with you. The word falls isn't correct translation. It literally means like if his hand falters. In other words, he just can't work. Uh, and then Leviticus 25, 39 through 41, if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and he sells himself to you, don't compel him to serve as a slave, as a hired servant and a sojourner. In other words, he's to be an employee, not treated beneath you. All right. And then he returns to his own family. And verse 47, 48, if a sojourner or a stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or to the stranger's family. After he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him. You know, in one sense, Yeshua is our brother and he can redeem us when we sell ourselves into Satan's service. Think about that. Leviticus 25, 54 and 55. If he's not redeemed in these years, he shall be released in the year of Jubilee. He and his children are with him for the children of Israel are servants to me. Now, what's interesting is if you look at Luke 4, 16 through 21, Yeshua comes to Nazareth, as was his custom. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written that the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Okay, if the poor among you has all these problems, and he's here to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim what? Liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That would be a Shemitah year. Are you following me? Okay, and then all the eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Okay, well, get a load of this. Let me go to this one. Yeshua starts his ministry in the 541st Shemitah year. 3787. That's why he proclaimed the year of liberty. It was in each square of seven years. All right. And he began his ministry in the fall of 26 going into 27. And that was 3787, which is the Shemitah year. Yeshua read this because it was literally a Shemitah year. All of the math adds up. Now, when Yeshua stood up and read Isaiah, proclaiming liberty, it was not a jubilee year like some think, but it was a Shemitah year. Now, let's see what I have here. Okay, currently, right now, in case you're wondering, we are in the 826th Shemitah cycle. The 118th year of Jubilee was celebrated. We are now two years in the 119th Jubilee. All right, with that said, let's stand. And let's pray. Avinu Malkainu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much that we can be on your calendar, that we know what time it is. Father, we are at the end, sunset of the sixth day. We're about to begin the seventh day where you will rule and reign. So, Father, open our eyes that we can see what time it is. Open our ears so we can hear you saying, come up here. Open our hearts, Father, that we would be right in our relationship with you. And Father, we just thank you so much for all those who want to be a light in these last days. We want to take the light of the Torah to all of the nations. And so Father, right now, I want to thank you for all those who give to your mission. Your mission should become our mission. And your mission is to take the light of the Torah to all the nations of the world. So we thank you for all those who give, Father, toward uh, 
this ministry of yours. And we thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. All right. I'm going to, for the second half, the last three weeks, second has we've had the two Hyoville boys. Okay, that was really good. Uh, we also had Pastor Joe from India. And then we also had Gal Cohen. Uh, did all of you like those groups there? Was that good? We're going to try to do that uh, more often. Maybe not three in a row, but we're definitely going to try to do that. Uh, what I'm going to do this afternoon is follow up on last week's a portion this second half because so much of it is really New Testament or Brit Hadashah related. And we were referring to God is looking for a church or a body without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And so I want to go over some of the other blemishes that we didn't get a chance to go over. And the next blemish that if a priest had, they couldn't minister until it got fixed. One of them was a crooked back or a hunched back. What does that mean? I believe that refers to someone who is loaded up with all the cares of this world. If you're loaded up with all the cares of this world, you're just loaded down and depressed. You can't go forward. So I believe one of our jobs is what it says here in Galatians 6.2, we're to bear one another's burdens. That's what we're to do. And so fulfill the law of the Messiah. But look at Mark 4, 18 and 19. Here it talks about the seed being sown on different types of soil. And it says that these are they which are sown among thorns, such as they hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Boy, when you think about the deceitfulness of riches, so many people are trying to get riches or win the lottery or whatever it may be. If I only got rich, I would solve all my problems. I don't think there's enough people in the world to tell you about all the rich athletes, all the rich Hollywood stars that are the most miserable people in all the world. Uh, but the greatest example I have is King Solomon. King Solomon had all the wealth. He had all the power. He had all the fame. And in Ecclesiastes, he goes, I hated life. I hated life. Do you remember why he hated life? Does anyone remember how the verse goes? Because someone else is going to get it all when I die. You can't take it with you. The purpose of wealth is to give it away. And that's what it is. God gives you all this wealth so you can help build his kingdom. It's to help build the kingdom. That is the purpose of wealth. And Solomon used all of his wealth, rather than glorifying himself, glorifying God and building up the kingdom, history would be completely different. The problem is with the deceitfulness of riches, everyone thinks it's for them. And they don't even tithe on it, for heaven's sake. It's all. I just read a story about this guy is being sued by his relatives after he won like $250 million in the lottery, or maybe a billion dollars in the lottery, and he wouldn't share it. It's like, I mean, it's just craziness. But anyway, if you get caught up with the riches of this world, it's so deceitful. Look at Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Yeshua says, come to me, all you that are labor and you're heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. What is his yoke? The commandments. That's what it is. And learn from me. I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Why? It's because you're yoked up with him. You don't have the yoke on yourself. It's like a bicycle built for two. He's in the front, you're in the back, and you're going for the ride. This comes from Jeremiah 6.16. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths or the ancient paths 
That's where the good way is. Walk that way and you will find rest for your souls. But what did they say? We don't want to walk that way. That's why they don't find rest. They don't want to walk in the ways of the Lord. They want to walk their own ways. The Bible says it's not in man to, who walks to direct his steps. And that's why in Galatians 6, 2, we're to bear one another's burdens, and that's how we fulfill the law of Messiah until they're able. Now, the next one is if they were a dwarf or a midget. Well, they are people who they are perfect in form, perfect in function, but they're kind of below the standard. What does that refer to? I believe in 1 Peter 2, 2, it says, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may what? Grow. We're supposed to grow. How many of you know adults that still act like babies? You know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> okay. Uh, how about, uh, oh, this one here. I messed that up. But look at this, 2 Peter 3, 18. It says, grow in grace. That means grace is a process. We grow in grace. End in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So we're supposed to grow in grace. We're supposed to grow in the knowledge. But look at this. Here we see 1 uh, Corinthians 13 and 11. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I become a man, I put away childish things. How many of us still do childish things? God wants us to grow up. All right. Look at Ephesians 4. 14 and 15. It says that henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But we need to speak the truth in love that we may what? Grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even the Messiah. So we're supposed to grow up. Now, how about this next one? A blemish in the eye. All right. That's from Leviticus 21.20. What does that mean? Distorted vision. Look at Matthew 7, 2 through 5. With whatever judgment you judged, you will be judged. Oh, that is so heavy. You know, for me, that's why I, even when someone else, uh, I always, you know, let them have mercy. Or I don't judge them because I don't want to be judged. Maybe that's selfish, but I want to be kind to everybody. So God is kind to me. It says, why do you behold the moat that is in your brother's eye, but don't consider the beam that's in yours? How will you say to your brother, let me pull out the moat out of your eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First, cast out the beam of your eye, and then you will see clearly to uh, cast out the moat of your brother's eye. Man, I can just see this big old beam, and you try to take the moat out of your brother's eye, and you're going to knock him in the head with the beam before you ever get close. Now, look at this one. You are inexcusable, old man. Whoever you are that judges, for wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judge, do us the very same things. Do you know what I find? So often, the people that are judging someone for something are doing the very same thing. That's how they can identify it. They know because they're very familiar with it. Let's look at Proverbs 30, verse 12. There's a whole generation. They're pure in their own eyes, and yet it's not washed from their filthiness. I believe that's this generation. They're calling evil good. They're calling good evil. Isaiah 11 Two and three. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and might, knowledge, and fear, and will make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge after the sight of his eyes. I tell you what, oftentimes people judge after the sight of their eyes. Next, we have, look at this one, scurvy. Scurvy is caused by an improper diet, a lack of fruit in your life. And I believe a lot of people are in congregations where they have an improper diet. All they get is milk and cookies. 
They don't get any meat or potatoes. Um, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. Okay, well, here we know the four major food groups. We're supposed to have grains and breads, fruits and vegetables, meats, milk, and dairy. But 1 Corinthians 3.2 says, I fed you with milk and not with meat, okay, because you weren't able to handle it. There are still adults who only take milk. It says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's a baby, but strong meat belongs to them that are full age. Even those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See, here we go. Newborn baby desiring the sincere milk of the word. <clears throat> but like I said, I fed you with milk and not meat, but you weren't able to bear it. It says, everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness because he's a baby, but strong meat belongs to those that are full age. And so here we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So we're supposed to have fruit in our life. Now, Acts 20, 27 through 28. It says, I have not shunned to declare unto you what? All the counsel of God, not some of the counsel. We need a balanced diet. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, that you are to feed the church, not fleece the church. Okay, big difference. And then scabbed. What does it mean to be scabbed? That is a skin disease primarily affecting the scalp. And look at Psalm 68, 21. God will wound the head of his enemies and the hairy scalp of such a one that goes on still in his trespasses. Isaiah 3, 15 through 17. What mean you that beat my people to pieces? You grind the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts. Moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are what? Haughty. They walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore, the Lord will smite with what? A scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. Why? Because they are haughty, thinking I'm holier than you. But look at Ezekiel 16, 11 and 12. God says, I decked you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your hands and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel on your forehead and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. You know when it says he put this beautiful chain on your neck? Do you know what that means? Look, Proverbs 1, 8 and 9. Hear the instruction of your father. Don't forsake the Torah of your mother. There are going to be an ornament of grace into your head and chains about your neck. That's what the chains about your neck is. You're graced with God's instruction, his Torah. We need to let the scripture interpret itself, not us try to interpret it. Does that make sense? Matter of fact, look at Ezekiel 16, 48 through 50. As I live, says the Lord God, Sodom and your sister haven't even done, she nor her daughters as you've done, you and your daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. What's the number one thing? Pride. It's always pride. Fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, and they were what? Haughty. This is why he smote the, with the scab the top of their head. And they committed abomination before me, therefore I took them away as I saw good. Okay, so the homosexuality, okay, was the abomination, but it was rooted in pride. Pride is always number one, which means you are greater than God. That's the very sin from the beginning. And then lastly, the last blemish was having your stones broken. That means you were unable to reproduce. Just like a woman can't conceive here, a man can't reproduce. That's what this is talking about. Look at Galatians 4, 18 and 19. It's good to be zealously affected, always in a good thing, and not only when I'm present with you. Then it says, my little children of whom I travail at birth again until Christ be formed in you. Okay, so Paul is saying he travails in birth. What he's talking about is reproducing disciples. All of us need to reproduce ourselves. 
we're to be spiritual mothers, spiritual fathers, and reproduce. Uh, look at this in John 15, 6 through 8. If someone doesn't abide in me, he's cast forth as a branch and it's withered, and men gather them and cast them into fire, and they're burnt. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. Here it is, my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you shall be my disciples. We are all compared to trees, right? And if we're compared to trees, we're compared to fruit trees. And what do fruit trees do? They produce fruit. And if you're not producing fruit, you're going to be cut off. You'll be good for something. You'll be good for firewood. Colossians 1.10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. We're to be fruitful, how? In every good work. Everything that we're doing has to be for the kingdom. It can't be for building our kingdom. It's got to be for building his kingdom. This is why in 2 Timothy 2, 2, it says, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We need to be grandmothers of the faith, grandfathers of the faith. We need to keep reproducing. You know the devil's trying to reproduce, and he's reproducing far more than believers are. We have to start reproducing. As a matter of fact, in uh, Galatians it says, it's good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I'm present with you, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again to Christ be formed in you. That's what we need to do. And then it says what I just quoted before. All these things that you've heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful ones who will be able to teach others, who teach others, who teach others. Okay, so now I'm going to go into the spots. What are spots? We went over the blemishes. And here we see, again, in Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, he wants to present himself a bride without spot. Can anyone tell me what spots are? Okay, how many of you know we're supposed to be without spots? Okay, what is it? If, if we don't know what a spot is, how do... Okay, do you want to know what spots are? Look at what the Bible says. This isn't me telling you what I think spots are. This is the Bible telling you what spots are. All right, so let's begin. Look at Jude. There's only one chapter, and it tells us. Woe to them, for they have gone in what? The way of Cain. They ran greedily after the Arab Balaam for reward, and they perished in the gainsaying of Kor, and these are spots. All right, so let's take a look at the way of Cain. Now, get a load of this. This is mind-blowing because it's horrible in English. You get the truth in the Hebrew. In Genesis 4, we're going to look at Cain. Uh, look at this. It says, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and what did he do? Slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, hey, where's Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And when he says brother's keeper, that word means protector to guard. And he said, well, what have you done? God says, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. A fugitive and a vagabond you'll be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, oh, my punishment is greater than I can bear. What a wimp. How about Abel's punishment that he uh, put on to Abel? He killed him. But guess what? It doesn't say your brother's blood Christ from the ground in Hebrew. It says your brother's bloods as if every generation that wasn't going to be born is crying out from the earth. It's not just singular. In Hebrew, it's in the plural. Every generation that was to be born is crying out from the ground. That is heavy. Okay. So 1 John 3, 11 and 12, look at this. It talks about the way of Cain. It says, this is the message that you heard from the beginning, okay? Genesis, that we should do what? Love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and killed his brother. And then it says this, why did he kill him? Why? It tells us right here why he killed him. 
because his own works for evil and his brothers were righteous. Wow. So here's the way of Cain. I have it up on the screen. First off, he was religious. Think about that. Cain was religious. He offered up sacrifices to God. So it's, uh, the way of Cain is being religious. There's no relationship with God. It's just a religion. Look at what it says in James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God, then the Father is this. What are we supposed to do? Visit the fatherless, the widows, and to keep himself what? Unspotted. There it is again. We're to visit the fatherless and the widows. So what do we see about Cain? Okay, Cain was envious. He was full of hatred, wrath, strife. He was a murderer. He was irreverent and a liar. When God asked him, what has he done? You know, here he's being sarcastic to God. Am I my brother's keeper? Totally irreverent of a way to talk to God. He was a liar saying he didn't know. He was also a man of the flesh. Look at Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Here's the works of the flesh that are manifest. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I told you before, as I've also told you in time past, they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the way of Cain is being in the flesh. Basically, that summarizes it all. So these are the things, if we want to remain unspotted, this tells us what to do. Now, what was the error of Balaam? He loved the wages of unrighteousness. He was self-willed and he was disobedient. As well, he was full of greed. Look at 2 Peter 2, 13 through 15. Spots they are and blemishes. There we go again. Sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. They beguile unstable souls. They have a heart that they've exercised with covetous practices. Cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following what? The way of Balaam who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So here is another spot, the heir of Balaam. He was all about the money, okay? And he wanted to beguile unstable souls. Now, look at this. Numbers 22.6, this is talking about Balaam. Therefore, I pray you, come now and curse this people for me. What does that mean? The heir of Balaam. He wanted to curse Israel, guys. He wanted to curse Israel. This is in Revelation. There are churches who have the doctrine of Balaam. They want to curse Israel. These are your woke churches. This is telling us it's going to be today. And then look at what he says to Balaam. I know whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. Wait a minute. That's supposed to be God saying, and he's proclaiming to have the voice of God. And look at this in James 3.10. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Here we bless the Lord, and then we turn around, and all kinds of foul things come out of your mouth. That is the way of Balaam. Balaam is someone who's one way among one group and another way totally among another group. They're unstable. They go back and forth. So James 3.10, you know, out of the same mouth comes blessings and cursings. It's not supposed to be that way. Now look at Numbers 31.16. It says, behold, these cursed children of Israel, or behold, these cause the children of Israel. This is the stumbling block. Through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord and in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Okay, so what is Balaam? The way of Balaam 
is giving, he's an evil counselor. He gives evil counsel to destroy Israel. They knew, he knew God was protecting them, and the only way he could destroy them is to do something that would break the covenant between them and God. All right? Now look at Revelation 2.14. This is speaking about a Christian assembly in the last days. And it says, I have a few things against you because you have there those that hold the what? The doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. Okay, what was the purpose of the doctrine of Balaam? Too many people focus on sacrifice to idols and commit fornication. That, that is what caused it, but the purpose was to destroy Israel. That was the purpose. The purpose of the doctrine of Balaam was to destroy, destroy Israel by having them break their covenant with God. Now, I have several verses I'm adding to your notes, so just write the reference down. You can look them up later. I'll read them to you. The first one is Jeremiah 16, 14 through 16. Listen to this. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord. It will no more be said, the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north. From all the lands the Lord had driven them, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, says the Lord, and they'll fish them. And after I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. So what God is saying, just like the first Exodus, which we talk about 3,500 years later, another Exodus is coming that's going to so far surpass that one that they're going to say, oh my gosh, it's not when God brought them out of Egypt, but when he gathered them from all the nations of the earth. No, yes, that's already happened to a small extent, but I believe there is going to be a major war, a major persecution, and they're going to blame Israel, and all of them, like in the Exodus, you're going to have millions fleeing to Israel within a very short time frame. That's what this is talking about. So look at this in Joel 3, 1 and 2. It says, Behold, in those days and in that time when I bring again the exiles of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I'm going to fight with them there for my people and for my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and did what? The big issue right now is the dividing of the land of Israel. This is the big issue of today. It is not to divide Israel the land of Israel. And so what we need to understand from this, the big thing is not financing Aliyah. The big thing is financing those of Israel that are committed against dividing the land. That is what is going to bring judgment. Does that make sense? Look at this, Zechariah. This isn't on your notes either, but Zechariah 1, 14 through 16. So the angel that communed with me said, cry, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. I'm very displeased with the heathen that are at ease. I was but a little displeased and they helped for the affliction. Therefore says the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house will be built, says the Lord of hosts, and a line will be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Okay, he's about to measure Jerusalem. Remember I told you how big the new Jerusalem is? Well, here is a line being stretched. This is what Revelation is talking about. And then it says in 18 through 21, I lifted up my eyes and I saw four horns. And I said to the angel, what are these? And he said, these are the horns which have what? Scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me these four carpenters. And I said, what do they come to do? And he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so no one would lift their head but these are coming to terrorize them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. Again, terror. Terror is coming against the four horns. Who are the four horns? I believe in 2001, the first end of Fada, those four horns represent the quartet whose sole purpose was to create a Palestinian state. And those four horns are the UN, the EU, the US, and Russia. Now look at Zechariah 2, 1 through 5. Watch. 
he lifts up his eyes again, and behold, there's a man with a measuring line in his hand. This is the book of Revelation. And I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to measure Jerusalem to see what is the breadth, the length. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. And he said, run and go speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited as a town without walls, for a multitude of men and cattle, for I, saith the Lord, I will be a wall of fire around her. Wow, I will be the glory in the midst of her. Now, one more thing. This is one of the heaviest things. Deuteronomy 23, 3 and 4. An Ammonite or a Moabite will not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their 10th generation, so they not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Why? Do you remember why? The Moabite and the Ammonite couldn't enter? Because you did not meet Israel with bread and water while they've come out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, a Pathor, a Mesopotamia to curse you. Okay, the big crime when Israel was exiting Egypt, their relatives, the Moabites and the Ammonites, didn't come to them to comfort them, to help them with bread and water as they went on their way. Instead, they hired Balaam to curse them. The, now, here we go. Are you ready? We're about to experience the second exodus, will we as a congregation give those who are going to, to our aliyahing, are we going to meet them with bread and water or are we going to curse them? Will it be written in any future Torah that we also, as a congregation, are coming against Israel, fighting them, going to Israel? Or are we as a congregation going to meet them with bread and water and help them? We want to be bringing bread and water, okay? But the thing is, the only way this is going to happen is if we support those who don't want a two-state solution. Because we want the right, we want God's people going back there. Okay, so lastly, the way of Korah. What is the way of Korah? This is another spot. He was a conspirator. He was envious. He was jealous, and he made false accusations. All right, Numbers 16, 1 through 3. We see Korah was the son of Ishar, who was the son of Kohath, who was the son of Levi. Okay, so take a look at this little chart. Levi's up at the top. He had three sons in blue, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. But did you know Levi also had Jochebed? So what does that mean? That means... Uh, Amram married his aunt. Okay? So Amram married Jochebed. That was his aunt. And had Moses. Okay? Well, Ishar, Kohath had four sons in the yellow. Kohath's four sons was Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. Well, Amram had Moses. Ishar had Korah. So Moses' uncle was Ishar. Korah's uncle was Moses. They were the nephews. And Korah was not a priest. And he wanted to be a priest because most of the Levites were not priests. Only the son of Aaron. Okay? And so that's why Korah, but you have to realize, Korah and Aaron were first cousins. But Korah wasn't even a priest. And he was jealous of that. And so let's go to Exodus 6, 18 and 20. The sons of Kohath, Amram, and Ishar, Hebron and Uziel, and then Amram took him Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife. So he marries his aunt. Okay, I don't know if you realize that. Okay, let's see. In Numbers 16, uh, 8 through 10, Moses tells his first cousin, I pray you, you sons of Levi, seemeth it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of Israel to bring you near himself to do the service of the tabernacle. Okay, they were to tear it down, set it up, move it around. All right. Uh, and then he says, but you seek the priesthood also? Uh, number 16, 19 through 21. A Kohath gathers all the congregation against Moses and Aaron to the door of the tabernacle. And the glory of the Lord appears unto all 
of the congregation. And then it says in Numbers 16, 32 through 35, that all the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their household and all the men who were for, for Korah and all their goods. They all went down alive into the grave. And then the earth closed. Earthquakes always open up, but I've never seen an earthquake open it up and then shut its mouth. And only Korah is mentioned besides Satan who comes out of the bottomless pit that's in the pit. And then it says, all of Israel fled at their cry, for they said, let's here swallow us up also. And then there comes out a fire from the Lord and burns up the 250. So there's this giant earthquake that swallows them up. Then a fire comes out and destroys uh, children from the tribe of Reuben because they were the firstborn and they thought they should be the priests. So what that tells us also is we need to be happy with wherever God has placed us. That's what we need to be happy about. Okay? Now, uh, last but not least, let me just think. Okay. I got so many good things here. I just don't know what to do. Aha. All right. So we need to realize the number one thing that God is looking for are people who are going to be against a two-state solution because the land belongs to God. We don't determine the boundaries. God determines the boundaries. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. <laughs>